Thank you, Hans. Uh, so I will start. Um, thanks for the introduction and also for the invitation that we can um, give um, um, insight in our facility and one of our main thing what we was doing in the last year was a um, project of the um, COVID-19 NMR and one of the part is the ligand screening of the proteins and the RNA of the virus. Um, before we go in more details about the project of the COVID-19 NMR project, I will introduce uh, our facility. Um, so the Center of Biomolecular Magnetic Resonance, the BMSZ, is, um, <coughs> has uh, um, seven groups, PIs, um, and they share the magnetic resonance machines. And um, so a lot of uh, people, around 100, 100, 150 PhD postdocs working at the BMSZ. And, um, and here we have a lot of uh, NMR machines um, and also different equipment we can use. And uh, all this facility is running by these those people. Um, they are also me and or Srida and me, um, a part of the um, facility guys. And um, the, the NMR spectrometer are distributed over the complete campus of uh, in, in Frankfurt. So that means if you do NMR in Frankfurt, uh, you stay healthy because you need to walk between the machines a lot. And, uh, but, uh, and uh, especially if you uh, need to, to uh, make the uh, management stuff, also things on the machines. Um, we are, um, or Frankfurt is, uh, since years, a part of this EU transnational nexus uh, program, coordinated in Frankfurt from Harald Schwalbe. And um, we, we offer this access to the high field machines since uh, years. So that means we do solution NMR at the high field. That is doing a lot by Frank Ler. He's uh, make all the protein NMR, the high uh, um, molecular weight proteins he measure at the high field with the latest experiments, what is possible. My part is more the RNA field uh, where I can help the people. And then in addition, we, we come now with this in-cell NMR and time resolved NMR. And in the last years, we started to do also these uh, fragment screening, and that was in main um, coordinated by Sreda. I, I show you first some examples for, out of these different area. Um, before I do that, <laughs> I, I go more in detail about the the um, our NMR machines of the solution NMR machines. So we have um, uh, all our equipment with uh, cryogenic propad. So that means that we get a maximum sensitivity. We have the standard HCN probe always. We can use at the different spectrometers. Um, there we have the maximum proton sensitivity with these kind of propad. But uh, because of we have a different um, spectrometer types, you can also select um, different cryoprobes. So for example, we have on the 800, we have these so-called so TXO cryoprobe, where the inner coil is carbon. So that is optimized for carbon direct detection instrument. But we have also um, um, at the 700, we can offer the Q QCI probe head where we can do phosphorus and nitrogen uh, experiment at the same time. In two spectrometers now, uh, we selected for screening, um, where we have the big sample changer and uh, some probe head, but I'll come in more detail on that. Um, 
the examples, for example, here we, we uh, do um, membrane proteins at high field, uh, where uh, Frank was to get, um, that was a uh, project from Oliver Serbel and in cooperation or uh, with, with Frank, Frank Leur, um, they do all these sophisticated experiments uh, to get the uh, assignment of these um, membrane uh, protein. Um, in another project was a cooperation with the Skabotza group uh, in Geneva. Uh, we record uh, all the spectra what is necessary to get the uh, three-dimensional structure for this small RNA hairpin. And that is important for these um, diseases what, uh, def de because of the splicing defect. And uh, the group was uh, find a um, um, ligand who bound to the to this RNA loop. And um, we was helping uh, in Frankfurt to get the structure out of that. Um, here is a cooperation with the Trantiric, with the, um, Lucas Trantiric in Cytec, Prono, uh, where we can show uh, the uh, in-cell NMR is possible also with these um, machines, where we have here a labeled, 59 labeled uh, RNA sample, and we can measure in the cell uh, also the, the spectra, and um, that was together with, with Anna Wacker and uh, Patricia, they, they, they do that, I guess, last year or the year before. Um, what is also interesting is uh, these time-resolved NMR, and that you can do either by light triggering, so that means we have a laser setup here in Frankfurt, where we can put directly the laser fiber in the magnet, and that is an um, so-called Shigemi tube, where we can uh, irradiate our laser in the um, liquid, and there we can uh, immediately um, see the, the kinetics. For example, here, the changing of these quadruplex uh, conformation. There was uh, one uh, nucleotide was um, with this uh, photo label group. And if the laser impulse come, then uh, there was a changing of the folding. And you can follow these directly in the NMR machine. Um, in another option uh, is to um, get this time-resolved NMR by using this rapid mixing device where we can uh, put um, some stuff like here, kalium, kalium also in, into the magnet. And also here we can change the, the uh, folding of these um, um, nucleotides also here. Uh, with this uh, mixing device. Yeah, and then comes now we, to that part what is important for the ligand screening, where we have um, a robot system where we can fill up the, the tubes and in these boxes, what you can see here. And we have an, a spectrum, on the spectrometer, we have uh, the sample changer where we can use five of these boxes. In each box, we can put 96 pro uh, samples and we can measure these uh, 480 um, samples. What is the screening setup here in Frankfurt? Um, we have different options how we get our samples. Also we, we have a, a library, what we buy it and um, the library um, and the target we mix together with this robot system. Um, on, on the NMR spectrometer, we, we have uh, installed this so-called sample jet from Hooker, where we can uh, cool each of these boxes individual temperature and um, measure cool it uh, by low temperature and um, and, ink, uh, and measure it uh, room temperature. And then uh, the data analysis will be used by these uh, different programs from Hooker and um, like um, uh, 
uh, the, the, for example, the CMCA and CMCSE, where we can uh, use directly um, these uh, spectra. And, and, and what we need for analyzation of our fragment based um, screening is the FPS. And uh, th there will be record a lot of data. And these data um, can be automatically uh, upload via the uh, logs and uh, can be that is a web based um, um, software and uh, that we work together um, and can um, store the data in these uh, logs program. I come now to more detail of our spectrometer we are using. What I say, we have two spectrometer for the screening. One is um, our 600 where we put the sample jet on, and that is a standard TCI cryoprobe, and that gives a maximum sensitivity. Here we can uh, use it for proton detected screening. That looks, for example, like that, that we um, mix up our compounds in um, these kind of mixture, what you see here. So that means we have uh, one mixer, mixture with 12 compounds. And if you compare these um, 1D with the um, single compound measurements, you can see directly that you see all the signals. You can in in the mixture, you find all these uh, signals. And if you have some shift of the chemical shift changing, then you can say, okay, these compounds was binding. Um, and we can mix up 12 compounds per mix. And we have, for one library, we have 768 compounds. And that means we have 64 mixes um, looks similar like these uh, from the A3 mix. In addition, we have on the other spectrometer, the other 600, we have uh, two cryoprobes. We have a uh, cryoprobe with, um, in addition with 19F, also a QSCI cryoprobe, where we can also do 19F, 9, uh, 19F. And we have a second cryoprobe where the diameter is um, smaller. And I will um, shortly show what are the reasons for that. If you use the 19F screening, then you have only, in, normally you have only one signal per compound. So that means you can mix up more compounds in one mixture. So for example, here you, you always put 20 compounds and each give it one signal. And you can increase the sensitivity by this QCI cryoprobe if you do also the proton decoupling. And uh, why now this 1.7 millimeter triple resonance cryoprobe? That is an advantage uh, because um, um, you can always use um, smaller diameter for, for, the, for the normal cryoprobe but then you have uh, the filling factor, you lose sensitivity. But if you use 1.7 millimeter tubes in a 1.7 millimeter uh, cryoprobe, then you not lose any uh, signals because of the filling factor. And if you compare the mass sensitivity, then you win a factor of eight to 10 compared to the normal cryoprobe. Um, that is... Um, that is a new equipment. Um, I will now hand it over to, to Sridhar. So, thank you, Christian. Um, basically, what you see on the right now on the slide is that um, we want to highlight the applications. Basically, um, here at uh, BMRZ and in particular, at the Schwalbe Group, we have a plethora of uh, experience accumulated over the years, uh, which means we have uh, 20 years of uh, experience in handling several uh, drug targets. Basically, you can see that uh, most of them are kinases or even uh, membrane proteins or extracellular domains like uh, FGFRs or even uh, um, better clotho like um, larger proteins, which also so these proteins were uh, basically investigated in uh, 
in a setting where academia and industrial collaboration with Sanofi, Merck, or GSK, which means we have uh, this experience. So putting this experience together, what we um, then uh, started is, as the COVID pandemic situation came in, then uh, we, um, together under the spearheading of Professor Schwalbe, we thought that why, how can NMR help to understand the structural elements within the SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. So we set our aim to understand the RNA, which is within the SARS-CoV-2, and also the proteins in terms of determining the structure, but also to see if these RNA elements or proteins for uh, trackability or ligandability as well. For proteins in particular would be um, more uh, to explore novel chemical space and for RNA it would be then ligandability or so. So within the INEX discovery or um, what we can see is drug discovery or development can happen in two fundamental ways. One, basically you start with fragment-based drug design which means that you have a target molecule, so it can be a protein, DNA, or an RNA, and then you have a small chemical library, and this library is sufficient enough to have a large, to explore large chemical space. You identify pockets on the target you are exploring, and these pockets, when you identify in the presence of the initially identified hits, then you can join these two fragments which have been identified, you can link them and this follows as a drug design. Or you can go the other way, identify the initial fragment, grow them, and this is the fragment growing approach. So this is basically a de novo drug discovery. On the other hand, what one can do is you can take FDA approved drug libraries and then screen it against uh, new targets, which means teaching the old drugs with new tricks, and then you can fine tune the identified drug from the FDA pool for the target of your interest. And so over the course of this um, short uh, lecture, we will see some examples where NMR um, at BMRZ helps uh, follow up with these interests. And within, uh, so NMR at BMRZ, also um, it, it collaborates uh, within INEXT and INSTRUCT we coordinate for SACS that instruct ERIC. And I will show you over the course an example where NMR, BMRZ, whatever the results comes in, we also perform ITC at BMRZ and the results from NMR goes for SPR or uh, the thermal shift assay at NKI in Netherlands, the TASSOS group, or we also subject our results to X-ray crystallography yeah. So it's kind of a coordinated effort. When you when a user comes to NMR over here, we also analyze the results and then say to them, okay, what next can be done as well. So now um, when it comes to screening, basically what we call is we have methods which are suitable for all levels of users. What do I mean by this? We would have users who are basically want to identify only hits which means novel hits. And from the hits, one can go to lead optimization or the user comes with a lead and then he wants to understand it in more detail. So for hit identification itself, we would then use ligand observed experiments and it could be either proton observed or fluorine observed. And then we use a set of experiments which are kind of indicated over here, STD, Waterloxy or T2, which these experiments are, are complementing each other in identifying fragment hits in different affinity regimes. So depending on the targets, we could perform either three of them or two of them. So, and we could also identify allosteric or orthosteric inhibitors if you have a, a cognate ligand bit bind. So that's ligand observed. If the user comes with a known ligand and then he wants to know where the ligand binds for with this target. And the target can be either DNA, RNA, or proteins. In this case, we can use target observed 
So over the course, I will also show some examples. In this case, what you can do is binding site mapping, and also you could easily determine affinities to those particular ligands. And for a sophisticated uh, user, where he has identified a strong inhibitor against the target, but it is difficult for him to understand without the structure for the lead optimization. So what we could do is also by NMR is to observe intermolecular NOEs. That means you can observe where the ligand exactly binds, which protons interact with which protons of the target. This will give you an insight to optimize your structure. So now going on to the ligand observed experiments, the sample and the fragment library are very important. So as uh, Christian rightly put it, he, um, we would have uh, a three millimeter NMR tube where you can use 180 microliter, or if the user says that I do not have so much of my target sample, and then we could go even now to 1.7 millimeter NMR tubes, which can have only 30 microliter of the sample, we could use uh, either proton detected or 19F detected. So this is for the target and the targets can include protein DNA or RNA. And now one of the important aspect is also the fragment library. And the fragment library, we would ask, we, it would be also useful when the user says, I can bring my own, or do I, um, can I bring my own lab fragment library? This is also possible. Or we have in-house two libraries, one is the DSI POIST, wherein we have 768 curated fragments, which means we have analyzed them, we know the constitution of them, and the data has been also deposited in the databases. So the 1D spectra of these are available, the quality control has been already done. And out of this, you can also find a subset of 100 fragments, which is 19 of fragments. In the same way, we have eOpen screen, which about 1,056 fragments, and 130 or 19F fragments. So they both 1H and 19F uh, screening can be performed. Now, having done samples and the fragment library, next comes for the experiments. So here, what I show is kind of an example where we identify that this molecule binds to a certain target. In this case, it was an RNA. And we had performed uh, three different uh, experiments. One, the 1D itself. So in black, what you find is blank 1D. That's only the ligand mixture and in the presence of RNA. And for the same mix, we also perform a water loxy experiment and a T2 experiment. And in this case, in the absence of RNA, you see that this ligand has a negative NOE. And then in the presence, the sign changes, which means, which is a direct indicator in water loxy that it is binding. In the same way, the T2 effect, five millisecond, 100 millisecond for the ligand alone, you see that there is no decrease. And in the presence of the RNA, you see a decrease in the intensity, which already directly gives you a hint that this is a uh, uh, binder to that particular RNA. And similarly, here you see a minor chemical shift, but in some cases, some other hits to the, for the same target would show CSPs greater than six hertz, what we had set as a cutoff. So this is one criteria what we use, or it could show here the water loxy is unclear, but the T2 effect is clear enough. So these are certain experiments or three kinds of experiments what we use, and we could also implement STD experiments for proteins as well. Now we screened uh, the SARS-CoV RNA. So the SARS-CoV RNA is large. And so what we used is to divide and conquer this RNA. Basically the SARS-CoV RNA was then um, cut into 20 pieces. And uh, here I just present a summary. So it's 20 RNA constructs were made. 768 fragments uh, were screened in mixtures of 64. Uh, 12 uh, compounds in a mixture, which means 64 mixes were made. More than 1,500 uh, samples were measured and there were several data sets acquired. And uh, you could see that um, the analysis, um, uh, the measurement time itself and then the intensive analysis of 180 hours yields to 69 high quality hits across these um, several elements of the SARS-CoV RNA. And in principle, for these hits, one can obtain and quantify as well. So if you obtain a CSP, 
then you could quantify what is the amount of the CSP, or you could also have a LOXI factor or T2 CPMG reduction in the percentage, which means the relative affinities between these ligands can also be kind of um, assessed. So within this uh, collaborative environment, I now go to an example, NSP5 main protease. So the NSP5 um, is a, a SARS-CoV-2 main protease, which is then, uh, which is a really an attractive uh, drug target. So within this, what we performed at BMRZ was an NMR-based screening. So we just used uh, these three experiments 768 fragments, and you see that 140 fragments bind to this particular protein. We have a hit rate of 18.2. We also then uh, subjected, so NKI uh, performed a thermal shift assay with the same set of the library, and then they identified 110 binders or so. So the overlap was around 23 hits, which means here we don't do only NMR, so you identify hits by NMR, Orthogonally, you identify also hits by other techniques, and this then comes out to show that you have several hits. At the same time, using the same library, Diamond, that's the X-ray crystallography facility in the UK, had performed uh, uh, the screening with X-ray. So here, if you would see, the NMR identified um, hits span across NMR only, hits, the NMR and X-ray hits, NMR, X-ray, and the thermal shift overlap, and the NMR and TSA. So in order to really narrow down uh, again, further we used uh, the SPR, and we do see that uh, nine of those 20 hits also show SPR results. So this is how the hit identification happens for RNA and proteins. So that's uh, basically where we see at, uh, in the ligand observed experiments. Now, we can get on, so the identified hits, where do they bind on my target? If we really want to define those things and what are the affinities or so, then we could go and observe on the target, where do they bind? You can basically map the binding site. So for these hits, we then, so this is the HSQC of the NSP5. And then we add in the different ligands at one is to uh, 20 or so, because these are weak binders, and then observe these chemical shifts. These chemical shifts then, if the assignments are available, you could then map the binding site. To really explain it a little bit more in detail, I would take another example of the SARS-CoV-2. So the SARS-CoV-2 has NSP3B, which is macro domain. So the macro domains uh, are also potential track targets because these uh, macro domains uh, go and deribosylate the immune response proteins and thereby they are act as guardians of the SARS-CoV. So NSP3P is also considered as a potential track target. So what we have done here at uh, BMRZ is a screening of this macro domain. So basically, what you see here is an uh, HSQC in blue is the upper state, and in uh, pink is the state wherein it is bound to a cognate ligand or a drug molecule. Once we have the, uh, assigned both of these proteins, which means the chemical shift perturbation over here, when you map onto the structure, you could see exactly the binding pocket. So apart from this, you could also follow these chemical shifts of these signals of the 15 and HSQC signals. And then when you titrate the ligand, you could then get the affinity by NMR. As soon as we had the affinities by NMR, we also wanted to see, get more um, thermodynamic information and at BMRZ, with the help of Vladimir Rogo, could also perform the ITCA, which we performed for the target with its drugs or the um, cognate ligand. In this case, it is the ADP ribose, and we find the affinity for this as well. So once we had uh, found the information that the drug binds to the macro domain, we also went ahead and submitted our NMR samples to um, Manfred Weiss and Jan Wollenhaupt, and they 
internally here, Verena had crystallized them and Jan and together with uh, Manfred Weiss, they then solved the structure. So it's an integrated approach. When a user comes to BMRZ, it's, it's kind of in more detailed analysis, one can get all the information. So if there is a sophisticated user where one says that I have a ligand and I want to have the structure, then I have an example here. So in this case of NSP3B, we also measured with the help of uh, Frank Lure here, you could label the protein with 13C15N and the ligand, what you bring in binds, but this is unlabeled and you can get intermolecular filtered NOE. And these NOEs are basically protons attached to your 12C carbon, gives an NOE with the protons of the protein, but the protons within the protein are filtered and then these NOEs will then show you which proton of your um, the ligand interacts with the proton of the protein. So in this way, these NOAs will drive you to calculate the structure and also further fine tune the drug molecule. So basically, um, this is coming to kind of N and I want to show you in this one big slide that the fragment-based screening can happen here for all classes of proteins. And SARS-CoV-2 has given a very good example for us to show that we have screened uh, NSP2-like proteins, which, is un which has a lot of unstructured protein, and uh, NSP5, which is basically a drug target. And also we have included into the portfolio proteins like nucleocapsid protein, which, is, which has intrinsically disordered regions and also the folded regions. So they're several uh, classes of proteins, what we can accommodate within our screening. I hope in a nutshell, I have given you a kind of um, a flavor to um, all the users who can come over here for drug screening or so. And now I hand over to my colleague, Christian, to give some concluding remarks. I guess we, can show that um, we um, can do a lot of things in Frankfurt. What can be uh, um, important for you, especially um, Sridhar show a lot of uh, data for these NMR-based ligand screening. And whatever you want to do, uh, you can, uh, before you write an INEX proposal, you can also ask me first uh, via email, it's given here, and then we can discuss what is possible. And thank you for your, um, I guess, let us thank you. Yeah, thanks.